Today on Horsepower, it's a quarter mile clash in Memphis and an engine tear down in the shop. But before we get to it, we got a little experiment that should be pretty interesting. We're going to take a handful of popular high performance components, bolt them onto one engine and see what happens in the way of horsepower. That's right. Here we've got three upgrades for a stock small block Chevrolet that are designed to improve performance, like long tube headers, an oil pan with a windage tray and crank scraper, and finally, an electric water pump we had laying around the shop. Okay, Joe, as soon as you're done, we're ready to run. All right, buddy. Our guinea pig for this experiment's a 350 Chevy we've used in a lot of dyno tests. It's totally stock except for those shorty headers, which we'll later replace with long tubes. First things first, though, let's see what kind of numbers we've got to work with. All right, our stock 350 made 290 horsepower, 329 foot-pounds as a baseline. Now let's start swapping out parts and see what we can get. Mechanical water pumps like this one that came on the Chevy do a good job of cooling. But if you could free up the crankshaft from spinning the pump, you could free up some horsepower, right? Right. Now this electric water pump from Proform we picked up from Summit Racing a while back flows 35 plus gallons per minute for adequate cooling. Plus, it's made of lightweight, die-cast aluminum. All right, our electric water pump improved our horsepower to 296 and our torque to 335 foot-pounds. A pretty decent improvement. For our next upgrade, we lose the stock oil pan in favor of this upgrade from Moroso. The windage tray and crank scraper inside together reduce the amount of oil surrounding the crank at high RPMs. Here you go. The result is improved bearing life, which we can't really measure here, but this should also help free up horsepower, which we can. Okay, we were two and two for gains that time. 298 for power and two more foot pounds of torque brings us up to 337. You know, almost any exhaust header is an improvement over a cast iron manifold like this one. And the shorties from Patriot we've been running so far today are no exception. But you gotta wonder just how they'll stack up against Doug's headers with the same one and five eighths inch primary, same three inch collector, but with the longer tubes, you get more scavenging ability, more bottom end torque, and more horsepower. Now the only real change is the motor made more torque in the lower RPM range with the long tubes, which is great for drivability. Now in no way was this trio test scientific, especially since all the modifications were made progressively. And of course you can't measure all the benefits here on the dyno. We can measure the benefits of power on the quarter mile strip here at a door slammer showdown in Memphis coming up. All the best clubs on Bill Street right here, so make sure you come here on Bill. It's Friday night in Memphis, and a horsepower crew and I are here on a hunt for heads up drag racing uh, with a stop on historic Bill Street, a place where it's cool to be a little flipped out and crazy. Put me on TV! I want to be on TV! Oh, wait a minute, he's with us. Yeah, the place is alive with the sounds of blues music, the aroma of barbecue and the taste of a little bit of libation. Hey, you Mr. Elmore. Thank you, dear. Now, what does Memphis beer, blues, and barbecue have to do with the drag racing we're about to cover? Let me work on that. Oh, I got it. Like the blues, door slammer, heads up streetcar racing as we know it, was born here in Memphis back in the early 90s. 
And this Mid-South shootout is an early season warm-up that shows how hot some of these spirited streetcars have evolved. I could not believe it. <laughs> It's a non-series event on a track that's been freshly ground smooth. Great for testing cars that are fresh from the winter mothballs. The challenge is to learn how to keep the car straight, how not to overpower the track, how to stay away from the guard wall, and in this case, figure out how to stop that smoke from coming out of the blower. Hey, don't let the empty stands fool you. We got word that some of the heaviest hitters in street racing are here to test their stuff for the season. Ought to be exciting. Well, wow. some of the excitement was the presence of a Chicago-based Fast Times team of Super Street fame, Sparrow Pappas and Nick Scavo. They're two Chicago street racing heavies who've joined forces with their twin C28s. 36, 38 for both of them or somewhere in that range. And our goal is actually to come back and show the dominance that we had back in the 90s and uh, early 2000s and, and we want to do it again in Outlaw 10.5. Well, we're going to go down south and show them that the North guys know how to race eighth mile as well. Spiros is the original car that he's had for 20 some years. Mine is the evil twin. Uh, mine's the one with the bad attitude is what we're saying here. So when you come out first time ever like this, what, what, what's going through your head? What, what Did I little... tighten every bolt? <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, I mean, we're, all, all we want to do is not have something fall off the car and look like an idiot. Boost controller on, and uh, just to turn the fan and water pump on. Okay. You dyno a motor, it makes power, but that doesn't mean it goes cleanly up on the brake. That doesn't mean it does a burnout cleanly. That doesn't mean it transitions 60 foot good. So, so all these things are the things we're about to find out. This is the moment of truth. Both Fast Times drivers made soft passes on their first qualifying runs, no surprise there. But Spiro, well, he was here to do more than just test his combination. And this quarter mile run in round two made his the fastest single turbo outlaw 10-5 car in the world. We got it. Well, it was a record breaking day for other racers too. On drag radial tires, Shannon Wren became the first of his class to go 200 miles an hour on the quarter mile strip. The car's pretty new, so we're still working on trying to get it down the track. And a uh, new uh, boost controller and some uh, new tires, Mickey Thompson tires, and everything's working pretty good. Uh, what's with the hood graphics there, Shannon? Uh, we drink a lot of Jaeger, so we figured uh, that'd be a good scheme, color scheme for a team. Bill Fletcher's twin turbo Camaro broke a track record for this run and became the second fastest 10-5 car ever. How'd that pass feel? It felt pretty strong, real good. Invariably, I got asked the question, are you gonna try to beat that? I don't think so. I think we're going to try to just maintain what we got and try to win the race. Why did you decide not to go out yesterday in the second round? Uh, we blew off a CO2 line that feeds the boost controller. By the time we found what the problem was, second round had come and gone. What can you do? I guess just go out and try to compete in elimination. Jimmy Blackman also beat his teammate who red-lighted here in semifinals. And although Funch seemed like a shoe-in in his class, he broke a rod on this round and Blackman coasted to a solo win. A win is a win and it's always uh, good to start off with one. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, second race of the year we win and, and the semis at the, the first race, so we're doing pretty good. Well, the new record holder Shannon Wren earned it the hard way, fighting his way to the finals and Although the final round wasn't pretty, it was good enough for a trip home with the top money. I shook the tires real bad, had to pedal it a couple times. And, but you know, I've seen that he blew up or whatever happened over there, so I just drove down through there. It was great. Well, congrats to all the racers who won, broke a record, or found a season tuna. Oh, and Mr. Jägermeister, I think you owe these guys a sponsorship. Just a thought. Another engine for another shot. All right. 
All right, while Jill was living it up in Memphis, take a look at what Buddy and I got dropped in our laps. It's a tired old small block that came out of a pickup that the trucks guys are working on next door. <laughs> the truck is a 66 C10 Kevin and Ryan bought to build a classic but unique daily driver. Everything was bone stock, including the 283 small block. Several months ago, they shortened the frame to make a short wheelbase truck. All right, back to this 283. Now they want us to rebuild it, again, for a fundamental, no frills daily driver. Now, of course, we've got to tear it down first, and we're gonna show you that process and also what to expect anytime you get a small block ready for the machine chop. We'll get started by draining the oil. Now this motor's pan came with a butterfly plug, which makes for a slow drain. When you're done, remember to recycle the old stuff in an oil-only container. When you're using a band style oil filter wrench, you don't want to place it in the middle because it can crush the filter. So you want to place it at the top or the base. Okay, next plug we want to pull out will be the block plug to drain the water out of the block. Now sometimes, like this one here, you don't get any water out of it. And there's a lot of crows you behind the plug where you gotta just chop it all out. And then there goes your water. After replacing the plugs, the front accessories can come off, like the fan, the alternator, the front pulley, and belt. Now we can remove the exhaust manifold. Okay, this water pump was showing signs that it was leaking out of the weep hole, but you should always replace your water pump and anytime you do a rebuild. A $30 pump will take out over a $3,000 rebuild. Might as well pull the fuel pump next, along with this cover plate and the piston behind it. Followed by removing the plug wires, distributor, and spark plugs. As you can see, the back spark plug has got more oil burning on it than the next one due to worn rings with this old of an engine. Okay, this is a cast iron intake manifold with a two barrel carburetor on it. It's good on gas mods, but does nothing for performance, so we're gonna get rid of both of them. Now we can go ahead and start removing the valve train, starting with the rocker arm nuts. Now this is extremely important if you plan on reusing these pieces. It's an organizer tray. We're not gonna be reusing any of this, so we don't need it. But if you don't put the stuff back in the original order it came out, you could get excessive wear. With the valve train gone, we can remove the cylinder head bolts except for a couple we leave loose on each end. This keeps the head from falling off while you break it loose from the gasket. Then remove the bolts and then remove the head. Unlike later model blocks, the early GM blocks actually had a breather baffle located here in the lifter valley. Now that's because the valve covers didn't have breather holes located in them and it allowed the block to breathe out of the rear here. Using a telescopic magnet from Matco, remove the lifters. It works most of the time. I knew it had to be one of them and it stuck. Okay, we've shown you how to tear this engine down to a short block. But now it's time for us to take a break. Yeah, and when we come back, we're gonna show you how to finish tearing this tired 283 down to its core. Hey, let's go get a burger. All right, man, let's or do it. We can do it. You wanna take a ride on the cart? Yeah, let me take a ride on the magic box here. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we crashed. <laughs> All right, with all the fun aside, we're back to tearing down Kevin and Ryan's 283. Now we're showing you the proper way to disassemble a Chevy small block and get it ready for the machine shop. In case you just joined us, here's a look at what we've done so far. We started by removing the front accessories, like the alternator, pulleys, and finally the water pump, followed by the heavy intake manifold and carb, then the valve train components, and the cast iron cylinder heads. Now we need to remove the harmonic balancer using this removal tool that also came from Matco. And done. Okay, next we'll roll the engine over to give us access to the bottom. After removing a few bolts and a little persuasion, take off the oil pan, which is one of the few parts we are gonna save. The oil filter adapter comes off next. And don't forget about the bypass housing. Followed by the oil pump. 
Now let's move up front to unbolt the timing cover. Believe it or not, a timing chain can stretch out like an old lady's knee highs. And this one here looks like it's been to way too many bingo games. Now let's remove the chain and cam gear. And use that gear as a handle to remove the camshaft. Don't worry about damaging the bearings because we're going to replace those anyway. And done. As you can see, these rods have been numbered already. Number three. You want to number both sides of the rod, top and bottom. All right, if your connecting rods are not stamped like these were, get yourself a set of number stamps like these. If you don't have access to number stamps, I'm going to show you how to do it with a simple center punch and a chisel. You can use a chisel to mark the rods pointing to the front of the engine. Then use a center punch to number the rods. And done. Now we can remove the rod caps. Install bolt boots to protect the crank. And remove the pistons and rods. After unbolting the main caps, we can remove them. Don't forget to mark them like we did with the rods. And done. We're going to be taking this gear off once we get the crank on the bench. As some of you can tell, with the larger parting line, it's a steel crank. If it was a cast crank, it would have a finer parting line. Man, there sure are a lot of parts for your hands being so clean. Yeah, I believe in soap and water. <laughs> All right, now we've got a torn down small block that's ready to go to the machine shop. Now it's going to go for a long ride with Buddy so he can do all the machine work and he'll bring it back ready to reassemble and go back in that C10 over on trucks. And done. If you're using an HEI ignition system, the key to better performance is a good distributor and coil that work together. Now that's what Petronix had in mind when they introduced the flamethrower distributor and coil combo. Now compared to original OEs, you get 67% more energy out of the coil for a 45% faster spark breakdown. Now they have this setup for all your domestics in both street and race applications. Now if you want to pick up one of these combos, contact Summit Racing for prices on your application. Every engine needs wiring to work, especially an EFI motor like this, but it doesn't have to look messy thanks to a new kit from Painless Performance. It's designed to protect and clean up any wiring harness installation. These laterally cut braided wraps can close up wiring bundles like this one without the need of tape or any additional fasteners. Of course, the kit comes with wraps in different diameters, along with a supply of plastic ties to complete your professional looking neat installation. Price of the kit is just over 200 bucks. Well, we're just about over our allotted time here on Horsepower. Join us next time, though, when we try out some cool new stuff on a pair of GM motors. We'll see you then.